Well, good evening, church. On this Monday night, I'd like to continue talking about uh, 1 Corinthians, which we have in the past in these devotions. But I'm going to skip to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This is one of those kind of difficult and awkward, <laughs> and awkward passages in Scripture, but crucial and important. There's several important lessons for us to take from this chapter. Uh, I want to use it to talk about uh, things such as our sanctification, our gospel testimony, as a church, uh, the importance of accountability and right use of correction and discipline as well. All of those themes are brought out here rightly in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, this will probably be uh, this week's and next week's devotion uh, because there's uh, a lot of things that we can glean and discuss from this that I think will make a big difference as we think about how we live as a church uh, together for the glory of God and within our communities. So let's go ahead and read through this passage, read through this chapter. Uh, there's only 13 verses, so don't get too, <laughs> too worried when I say we're going to talk about <clears throat> the whole chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans, for a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though I am absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved. Here it is. So that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy, and swindlers, or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality, or greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside, and then quote, Purge the evil person from among you. Strong language, strong words from the Apostle Paul here. Uh, and obviously, they were probably dealing with things that uh, we're not <laughs> dealing with things within our local uh, congregation. But the principles, and I think also some of the, the problems that they had, we're tempted to in that regard as well. Now, by means of background, we remember the city of Corinth uh, in biblical times was uh, known for <laughs> its gross immorality and temples to false goddesses and debauchery and, and all of those things that we would associate with that, that kind of cultural climate. The city was actually so bad that the other cities in the world uh, created a word or basically used the, uh, the city Corinth or, or said if someone was behaving as a Corinthian, that word really translated to to represent gross immorality and drunken debauchery. They would talk about behaving like a Corinthian to, uh, to uh, get that point across. Now notice also that Paul is talking about, he's going to go from the specific 
to the general as he's addressing sin and the proper response to it, not only individually, but within the fellowship of the church, within those who are claiming to be Christian. Uh, so here we go. Let's look at the problem. The problem is obvious. The problem is that uh, the Corinthian churches were arrogant and they were tolerating sin. Verse 2, and you are arrogant. It's not only that there's this immorality uh, among you, it's that you don't mind that you're tolerating it and that you are arrogant. The problem with that, there's many problems with that, but one of the main problems with that within the life of the Christian is that is a, it is a complete neglect of our calling to be sanctified. It is a complete neglect of the call that God has given his people to be separated from those kinds of things. And not only are they not separated, they're indulging in them, and they're indulging in them to a degree that is worse than even some of those who aren't claiming Christ are indulging. Now let's look at the word sanctification. Our call is to be sanctified. That just means uh, to be set apart for God, to be set apart from sin in the world, set apart for God. Uh, the Wycliffe Bible Dictionary defines sanctification this way. It says, separation from what is sinful and consecration to what is righteous and according to God's will. So there's kind of the, the twofold. It's separation from the sinful and then it's the uh, doing God's will. It's the being righteous and pure. And we know the only way we can do that is to be uh, repentant and to utterly look to Christ's work on our behalf in faith. Because nobody is like this on their own apart from God. There are many scriptural proofs that talk about sanctification. 1 Corinthians 5.20, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says this, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. May your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. John chapter 17, verse 17, as Jesus is praying before he's crucified, he prayed, Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. So we see the importance of our call in sanctification. Just generally, we're to be set apart from sin and living for God and His glory. And then we think about their behavior. They were... Immoral, and their immorality was worse than that of non-believers, even in Corinth. It says you have immorality of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans. Like unbelievers would have stood up and confronted the issues that you, church, have yet to confront within your local assembly. What a high condemnation that is. And not only the immorality, the arrogance... Verse 2 says, you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? He says, why are you celebrating these things? Your arrogance is causing you to celebrate that which you should weep over. We think about arrogance. It's a common theme in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. For a while... There is jealousy and strife among you. Are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? And then verse 21. Let him who let no one boast in men. Stop boasting in self. Chapter 4, verse 7. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? We talked about this verse last week. And then verse 18. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you, as though there were no standard, as though there were no accountability within the body, as if there wasn't a God who was going to judge 
uh, sin and hold his people accountable. Their arrogance. Maybe they were distorting Christian liberty. Maybe they assumed that since Christ has forgiven their sin, Christ would forgive all their sin, and it doesn't matter if they tolerate it or to continue in it. Christ has just forgiven that anyway, so what's the big deal if I keep living this way? The Bible addresses that as well. Galatians 5.13 says, You were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So we've been freed from the bondage of sin, from the wrath of God because of Christ's work on our behalf. So we're not freed so that we continue to, to live in sin. We're freed so that we can love each other rightly and serve each other. 1 Peter 2.16 Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. We've been freed to live for God. We've been freed to serve God. We have not been freed as a covering for evil. The Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 20, talks about Christian liberty. And it really is a great explanation of Christian liberty. It says that Christ has purchased for believers that liberty, which means freedom from guilt of sin, freedom from the condemning wrath of God, freedom from the curse of the moral law. And then it continues. Uh, but then it says, basically the challenge that is what we're talking about tonight, not to use, not to presume upon Christian liberty, to practice any sin or to cherish any lust. Doing so, presuming upon Christian liberty, twisting it to mean that you can do whatever you want to do because sin doesn't matter, Presuming upon Christian liberty, the Westminster Confession says, is the end of Christian liberty, which is that being delivered out of the hands of our enemies, we might serve the Lord without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. That's the goal of Christian liberty. That's the point of Christian liberty. That's the call of Christian liberty. That we might, since God has saved us out of the hands of our enemies, that we might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness, which has to come from him all the days of our lives. So we think about kind of the difference between humanistic Christianity and God-centered Christianity. Humanistic Christianity says it's all about me. Christ has died to save me from my sins so I can do whatever I want. So then the question then becomes, how can I get what I want? And how can God spoil me? And uh, humanistic Christianity is all about my place in heaven and giving me what, what I want. And even also maybe my earthly position and my priorities and my liberty. See, humanistic Christianity is all about me. To the neglect of, forsaking the glory of God. Where a God-centered Christianity resembles this, 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. John 15.8, Jesus said, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so that you will be my disciples. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 7, now therefore it's already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. The very next chapter in Corinthians, he talks about why you suing each other. Why would you rather not accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated than basically destroy your testimony suing other people who you say are Christians? So what about us? Where are we? Do we have a truly God-centered Christianity. It's the only Christianity. Are we continuing to, buy, to battle against sin in our life? To seek to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to live sanctified for the glory of God? So let's think about the solution and, and the reasons there. What should they have done? They should have disciplined. There should have been accountability within the body. They should have corrected each other. And honestly, under the authority of the elders, they should have handled it. Verse 2 says that they should have been removed. Let him who has done this 
be removed from among you. Verse 5 says, deliver him over to Satan. Right? The, the, the point is clear. People living like this, people whose lives make clear they're not in love with God, they're in love with self, and they're distorting Christianity and destroying the testimony of the church, should not be allowed to do so. They should not be allowed to continue within the body as if everything were okay and there weren't anything going on. They are to be removed. It doesn't sound very Christianly, does it? But it comes down to the importance of the purity of the bride of Christ and the power of the testimony that we're to give. It's biblical. It might make us uncomfortable, but it is absolutely biblical. And as a local church, we have to seek to, uh, to live up to Scripture even when it makes us uncomfortable, open, unrepentant, continual sin must be addressed. Why? Because love and discipline are not contradictory. Multiple places in Scripture it says that the Lord disciplines the one he loves. So discipline from God is actually evidence of the love of God. Proverbs 3.12 says that. Hebrews 12.6 says that. And Revelation 3.19 I'll quote that phrase that the Lord disciplines those whom he loves. Verse 5 also gives a clear reason why correction is important. That his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. We are not to give the impression that sin is okay. We are not to give the impression that God is not a holy God. That God does not care about his justice. We are not to give false assurance to those who are clearly not saved. Discipline does not treat the offender unfairly. Discipline is to the benefit of the offender. And that's the point. It also matters because it goes to the purity of the church. Verse 7, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us celebrate the festival. So, so it's to purify the church. Wickedness, open, unrepentant, continual sin within the fellowship must be addressed for the purity of the church and to keep it from spreading, to keep the corruption from getting worse and worse and spreading within the body. Left unchecked, it absolutely will grow worse and worse. God also holds the church accountable for what it tolerates. We have this example given in Revelation in a couple different places. Revelation chapter 2, when Christ is talking to, or when God's talking to the church. Revelation 2, 14, to the church in Pergamum. It says, I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam. You, you're allowing that to be held and taught within your church. Revelation 2.20 But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants. So, so we have here the church being held accountable for what it tolerates within the body. And um, next week we'll actually talk about some principles um, why this is so important and ways in which we can apply this in some concluding thoughts. But let's also make sure that as we think about this chapter that we don't just point to particular sins and say, well, I don't struggle with that one, so I must be okay. We must look inwardly and battle the sin that we do wrestle with and battle the sins that we do struggle with Continue to run to the cross of Christ. Continue to beg God to, to work out our sanctification. Continue that the power of the Spirit living in and through us would do that. Again, for the glory of God, for a God-centered, a Christ-centered Christianity, not about us. Let's pray and ask that God would continue to work that out within us individually so that we would be a fellowship known for those things. Father, we are thankful for your love and we're thankful for the task to which you've called us. We're thankful that 
you have saved us. And again, we confess that we cannot sanctify ourselves. We need you. Uh, we do desire to guard our testimony, to be a people that uh, shows others that our reliance is upon you, that our dependence is utterly and completely upon you, that you are a good and gracious and saving God, and that although you hate sin, you will be gracious to sinners and save them and sanctify them so that we would not be bound by sin, but we could enjoy the freedom and the true liberty of serving you and being right with you forevermore. Pray that you would guard the testimony of our church, that you would use us again with every day that you give us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.